And thanks, Shannon, for that presentation earlier. That was awesome. Um, there's a few things I can segue off to get into the sort of the thrust of what Shannon was talking about. But first, I'll kind of introduce myself. So, yeah, my name's Cam. I run my own law firm, which is Cam Rogers Legal. Um, I was based in Melbourne for many years, but recently moved back to Adelaide for personal reasons and enjoying being back here. But most of my clients are based on the Eastern Seaboard, so I've got clients in Brisbane and Melbourne and Sydney, Hipster Whale, Defiant Development, um, Not Doppler in Sydney, Chaos Theory Games, Mighty Games, so not these guys, but the other Mighty team that are based in Melbourne. So I've got a pretty broad uh, spectrum of experience in working in games. And you can tell I've been working in games for a long time because that is an iPhone 3. And um, <laughs> I just realized I probably should have updated some of my slides, but in any event, here, that's where we are. So yeah, I've been working exclusively in games for about um, eight or nine years now. Um, there's my contact details should you want to get in contact with me. The other one is um, Cam Rogers Legal on Twitter. That's probably the only social uh, platform that I tend to spend any time on these days. So feel free to reach out. I'm pretty free with my time and always happy to have a conversation about any aspect of what you've got going on. Um, in terms of what Shannon was talking about before, I guess what I see myself, how I best facilitate, is by making sure that the, the guttural slides of the, of the snakes that he was talking about aren't as bad as what they potentially could be or that they don't exist. And also to prepare you for when good things happen in the form of a ladder, because that can present itself with unusual opportunities. Which publishers do you want to work with? What happens with this amount of money? How does, what is tax? Is that a thing I need to worry about now? And all those sorts of problems. So essentially I can help from the very beginning of a concept all the way through to delivery, working with publishers, and then also sort of that secondary exploitation of IP in the form of merchandising and potentially TV series and, and um, you know, that type of thing as well. But the purpose of today's talk was I wasn't really exactly sure where to pitch it. Um, so I just wanted to run over some legal essentials for indie games producers and talk about some of the major pitfalls that I kind of typically see working with emerging producers and developers. So it's going to be a pretty pretty breezy overview of some kind of quite complex topics. So by all means, feel free to kind of jump in and let me know if you've got any questions because a segue into some specific examples is always the best way to kind of uh, cut through some of the ideas that we're talking about here. So what am I going to be talking about? First of all, I'll talk about some basic corporations law and the various options you've got there for setting up before you get going. Then I'm going to get into some basic IP law, so what it is, what does it protect, why is it important. Then I'm going to talk about how you engage with contractors to actually, or third parties to actually get the game made in the first place, what those relationships might look like, do you use an employee or a contractor, what's the difference, what does it mean to you. And then finally, I'll talk about a bit of very basic tax law, uh, that's more kind of the domain of um, accountants and their magic, but I'll run over it really quickly just for the sake of kind of completeness. But by all means, uh, yell out if you've got any queries. So basic corporations law then. So first of all, you need to work out which model suits you. You've got sole trader and you've got partnerships, which is the one that I'm pretty down on at the moment. And finally, you've got corporations or proprietary limited companies. So, so this basically covers off any model that you could possibly really have as you approach business. The most basic one would be just you as a sole trader. So the advantages there are obviously maximum flexibility. You can't get into too many arguments with yourself. There's minimal administrative burden. You basically just go online, register for an ABN, and away you go. You're ready. That, that's all you really need to do. The disadvantages, though, kind of include the higher level of personal risk. So anytime you enter into a contract, for example, with a third party and it's just you, you don't have the protection of the corporate veil in the form of a proprietary limited company. That brings into play your personal assets and, and wealth or anything like that that, poten that potential third parties could go after. So that's probably the biggest disadvantage is the, the kind of the risk profile is a bit higher. Um, on a kind of practical level, I like to refer to the, the Robinson Crusoe effect, um, which is nullified if you're in a place like Games Plus or the Arcade over in Melbourne. But it's just the idea of when you're a sole trader, working by yourself on a game by yourself, it starts to feel a little bit like an echo chamber 
and you can start to talk yourself into things. You start to kind of question yourself at times. And so sometimes, particularly for a collaborative medium such as games, it's better to be working with other people. And if you are working with other people collaboratively, being a sole trader is not necessarily the best way to go. So in that sense, it's inappropriate if you're working within a team. Uh, the other disadvantages, of course, is that any revenue that comes in, you're responsible for your own tax and probably superannuation as well. But as far as what you need, the sole trader just need, requires an ABN, probably a tax file number and possibly GST registration and public liability insurance. So that's, you know, the, the bare basic way of getting into a project. Just you, your ABN. Uh, contracting with third parties and just getting it done that way and it all falls back on your shoulders. So moving outwards from there, the next model is probably partnerships. So from partnerships you reap the benefit of working within a team so you escape that Robinson Crusoe effect and some of the other things. They're pretty easy to set up. Um, that again, it's got a low administrative burden and it's just basically an agreement between people as to how you're going to manage this process. Um, you don't even really need to have a formal partnership, but it's obviously advisable because you're going to be working with people and you need to kind of understand what everybody else's intentions are at that time. And th probably the best thing is that when the game is released and money starts coming in, the tax obligation is shared with respect to that. So it makes a lot of financial sense. It's got a really easy threshold to sort of set up. It's not as expensive as setting up a proprietary limited company and it shares some of the benefits of actually setting up a company. However, yeah, you got a question? I've got a little bit of a confused sound. If you were in a partnership with your joint agent here, wouldn't you be getting sort of double tax because you're paying tax on the money that's coming in and you pay tax to your kids and so on and so forth? Uh, the money in a, in, a doesn't, in a company, that would be what you're talking about is frank credits, which would be, that's more of an accounting question, to be honest, rather than a legal one. But there's, there's a means to get around that problem and it's, an un it's a common problem that you would get. For a partnership though, it's really just a group of individuals working together and it doesn't have the same benefit of what a company does. But I believe from a tax perspective, it'd still be okay. But there are other problems associated that are kind of linked to what you're saying. So the biggest one really is that if the partnership gets into debt, then whoever you're indebted to will be come after each of you as individuals in order to recover that debt. So what that essentially means is if there's three people in a partnership and there's a $1,000 debt, the first two people don't have any money, but the third person has got $1,000, then that third person is going to be, they're gonna come and they can potentially take all of that money, notwithstanding the fact that the partnership was a group of people and not just that individual. So that's probably the, the biggest downside from it, aside from probably the intellectual property issue, which is the next one. So IP, which I'm gonna get into more meaningfully in a minute, um, it, the partnership structure doesn't resolve that problem for you in the same way that a company does. And for reasons that I'll get into shortly, um, yeah, an IP dispute with respect to a game or a film or anything is generally the number one way that it doesn't get released. So that's, they're the kind of two major reasons why I don't suggest partnerships for most people. I think that either a sole trader and going it alone or a corporate structure with a company is the best way to, to go about it. So why do I think of companies? Well, as opposed to a partnership, a company is, an, is a distinct legal entity, so the shareholders are not exposed to as much risk. So what that basically means is the company is able to enter into contracts and you as shareholders of that company are therefore protected because you are not personally entering into the contracts, the company is. So it adds an extra layer between you and the risk. So say a company enters into a third party contractor and the company kind of, you know, ultimately goes b broke through no fault of the people, you know, that are, that c are controlling it. The individuals themselves are not liable to any risk. So the, the third party can come after the company, but it can't come after the individuals that are behind it themselves. So that's probably, that's what they refer to as the corporate veil and is the number one benefit of setting up a company. It's a risk minimization factor and it means that your personal assets are not in the firing line should things go wrong. But there's also other reasons why it's important as well. Um, there's essentially a lower taxation rate for the company. 
and for the franked credits example that you gave, gave before, if the company has paid tax, then the money that flows through to the individuals is franked at that point and it's taken into account so that you don't wind up paying as much tax. And control of the company is documented and disputes are generally able to be uh, resolved fairly easily between the shareholders because typically a company will have a constitution, which is what it's given from creation and it's a requirement under the Corporations Act. So when you go to your accountant and get the company set up, you're provided with a constitution, which is essentially a rule book for how the company will be run. And if you're feeling particularly keen, you can also get a shareholders agreement drafted, which really mines into the specifics of your company and addresses how you want it to be run and it can resolve a lot of these issues uh, from the outset. I mean, the biggest uh, disadvantages, I suppose, from a company is really just cost. I mean, you basically have to go through an accountant. Um, you could do it yourself, but I advise against it because you have to answer a bunch of questions and if you get any of them wrong, then suddenly you've got a problem with trying to unpeel what you've uh, put down. But it would probably cost in the vicinity of about $1,000 to get it set up for a basic company. And then that's the entity with which you will be entering into contracts with third party and it just means that you've got that level of protection. So that's probably the chief benefit of why most people and most entities, most uh, developers in Australia that are interested in working with third parties would set up a company at some point. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of that stuff? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I mean, what the, the common example there would be banks. So if you borrow money from a bank with the company, then they'll ask for personal guarantees from the directors. They don't respect the corporate veil, the banks. But in the general cut and thrust of business, it's like, yep, we're entering into a contract, it's a publisher agreement. They don't ask to see the, the financials of how the company is going. It's just, it's an acknowledged means of business, the primary reason of which is that protection. And it's, you know, a limited liability corporation over in the States achieves th exactly the same thing. So it's a fairly common structure in, in most countries, really. Yeah. Cool. So I guess that, you know, the, ma the main thing outside of that, if you're starting out from, let's, let's make a game. What is the entity that I'm going to be used that's doing it? You've either gone with a sole trader or you've gone with a company. You've got that set up. So what's the next thing that you should probably be thinking about? Well, the, the number one thing that I would be thinking about at that point would be copyright. Um, copyright as an independent company is probably the most valuable thing that you're going to own. It's the, the central, most important thing with respect to your game. It's what the game is based on. And so if you don't have that stuff in order, um, it, can, it will be potentially devastating for the company and re often results in projects not able to be released. And going back to what Shannon was saying earlier, one of the main reasons you've got to start thinking about this stuff early is because when you are speaking to publishers, one of the main things that they're going to ask you about is who owns this game? Can you prove that you own this game? If a publisher is going to come along and sink $150,000 or more into your project, they've got to know that you own it. Otherwise, they're going to be sinking money into a project that can never be released. And so that's one of the, you know, that's, that's the practical reality of, of what this stuff ends, uh, leads to. But before I go into that in too much detail, I should probably just talk a little bit about what is copyright. So copyright, it could have been called, you know, it's, it's as the name purports. It is the right to copy something and the right to, to permit others to copy something. Its purpose is to promote financial gain. So what does it actually protect in that sense? It protects a range of materials, which includes photographs, artistic works, uh, paintings, drawings, maps, musical works, films, and written materials. And that includes games, uh, particularly the code of games. That's kind of what's protected. One of the main things to understand is that copyright is automatic. So a game is protected by copyright automatically from the time its code is written. You know, I often hear from my clients some sort of things like, how do we register the copyright? What have we got to do? 
Copyright is automatic from the moment of creation. The, the, the idea that once you've got it down on paper, there is copyright in that material. You don't have to put it into an envelope and send it to yourself or do any of these types of things in order to establish it. That is a sort of a, a Chinese whisper, I guess, that emerged because it would allow you to at least prove that something was dated back to a certain point. However, it doesn't, it's not a requirement to, uh, to mean that, uh, to, that, to make uh, copyright protection actually exist in what you're doing. It's an automatic thing. So what does it not protect then? And this is important. So it doesn't protect ideas, information and styles or techniques. What it does protect is the way that those things are actually expressed. So this is why you go onto the app store and you look at things and you go, there's game A, there's the clone, there's another clone, there's another clone, there's another clone. And the reason is, is because they haven't, generally speaking, actually copied the, the code itself. They've just ganked the idea, made it look kind of quite similar and away we go and so it's very difficult in that context to actually close down some of these games because you have to actually prove that they actually copied your game which is a lot harder than it kind of sounds so the most imp other most important thing about what it doesn't protect is that is it's the function of the co of the computer program so copyright does not give a copyright owner monopoly on what the program does Copyright gives the owner the right to prevent someone else from duplicating the expression of the set of instructions that constitute the program. So in other words, it's not the idea, it's the way that the idea is expressed. And again, if you go back to what I was saying before, the moment that you write something down, that is copyright. People can't take what you have written and reproduce it elsewhere because that is yours. However, the ideas and the concepts and the style of it, so you can create a game in the style of Super Meat Boy, for example, and no one's going to come after you for that. But if you were to actually borrow artis artistic assets or code from that game and reproduce it directly, then you would have a copyright infringement. Does anyone have any questions about that distinction? Yes? Uh, that's the actual expression of that is, is theirs. So that image on a paper or on a screen as it exists there, nobody else would be able to reproduce that or copy it without the consent of the artist. Now there are certain caveats to that that I'll get into, but that's, that's basically a fundamental tenet of copyright. It's automatic. Anyone else? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's that's why it sort of gets complicated and why copyright disputes are notoriously expensive. Um, particularly when you've got artwork that's out there that's quite high profile and people kind of um, rip it off. And then you've got sort of exceptions to that, which is like parody and things like that, which are actually allowable and fair use, which does provide some kind of wriggle room with respect to that stuff. So what you'd actually be looking for there is basically uh, probably somebody that had proximity to the original artworks quite early on, and so was able to release a product that was substantively similar you know, within Kui of when the first project was originally released. If something was kind of out there and was freely available and three years later something comes along that looks quite similar to it, you've probably got less of a claim. Because getting back to my original point about its copyrights, re reason for existence is to promote financial gain. That's what it's there to protect. So the more that something is infringing on the market of an existing product, the more, it's, the more likely it is to be viewed as something that is infringing copyright. That's sort of the way it goes. Now, I know people create games from art for all sorts of reasons, but unfortunately the law views it as a financial thing. So that's, it. that's the way that it's looked at. 
Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, you can't, you kind of could. So a passing off claim would be basically deceiving third parties into believing that the product was originally, is belonged to somebody else. So that's, that's different to copyright. That's more of a kind of a consumer rights kind of an, a, an aspect. But you could potentially, I mean, yeah, these, all of these types of things are open to you in the event that it happens. Um, but to be honest, I think a lot of the time people get, really bogged down in trying to protect their ideas. You know, I think that in the context of everybody out there making games, and you've seen how clogged the app store is, for example, these days, if you're speaking to, to publishers and you've got a cool idea, and I'd encourage you to be quite open about sharing what it is that you're doing, mainly because if you're, you've got a cool idea and you're halfway through getting the thing made, then why wouldn't the publisher want to work with you? What are they going to do? Go and hire another team, steal your work, and you know they're already six months behind. So I, I feel like at times people are very precious about sharing um, their ideas with people and the work that they're working on. We're pretty fortunate in Australia that the game scene is a lot more kind of collegiate than it is overseas. In, you know, in the States, people are very protective about this kind of stuff. But in other places like Finland and Australia, you go to the games events and people are quite open about what it is that they're doing. You know, you go to um, you go to GCAP here or you go to PAX here and you go to the um, Indicate and people are pretty open about, yeah, this is, you know, it's barely in beta but we're here and we're demoing it. And people are pretty cool with that type of stuff. And so, you know, I think that's the best way to be. You know, it's like uh, high tides float all boats in that sense. It's like the more information that's shared, the better we become as an industry. So. You know, the, the copyright stuff that I'm talking about is really kind of high level and it's more that I'm presenting it to you so that you're able to exploit your products as best as you can because publishers and so forth are going to ask about this stuff and if you haven't got it nailed down, then it's going to become a problem later on. So if you've got a game out there, then who owns the copyright in the game? So this is a a kind of a situation that I come across pretty often, particularly with people that have been to game jams and things like that. In the absence of any written agreement, it's unclear exactly who owns the game. So you go to a game jam, you come out, you're working together for three months. At that stage, everybody collectively owns the IP in the game. So that means that any time you make any decision about the game, you've got to get agreement from all four, potentially five, up to ten people, whatever you've been working on whoever you've been w working with and it becomes a real problem down the track it's all good when you're in the game jam itself but then when you leave and you're trying to get things done one person leaves because they want to work on something else you've got to go back six months later and say hey you know this game that we all worked on we're still super keen on it you've lost interest but we need your agreement in order to move this thing forward so copyright doesn't operate as a kind of 50 percent or more scenario if somebody owns 1% of the copyright, you need that person's permission or, or acceptance in order to be able to utilise the underlying IP in the project. So if there's more than one person involved in the creation of the game, you really need to clarify first how the IP is going to be owned. And what that might mean in the context of a game jam is that if it's really one person's idea, then that person should probably own all of the IP on behalf of everyone. And what that kind of means is there's other ways of resolving other issues. So, you, you know, a money dispute is resolvable. An IP dispute isn't. So one person owns the IP, but everybody agrees that we're all going to take 10% of the revenue that this game kind of produces. And in that way, you kind of make it a money issue, which is, if it goes wrong, is nasty, but it's not as fatal as an IP dispute. And I've worked on several projects, very cool ideas that are most of the way through and there's been a, a falling out between one or more of the kind of originating creators. And the project is dead in the water. You know, that's, that is it. Everybody's had to walk away. And the game is kind of sitting there in limbo and no one's been able to actually work out what to do next. And it's a horrible thing to have to work through because there is literally no easy solution. You need agreement from everybody. And that's much easier to get at the very beginning. So, um, jumping around a bit here, but... Going back to who owns the copyright in the game, it's, as I was saying at the beginning, it's the person that creates it, but there are certain caveats to that. 
So the biggest one there is an employee. If you're an employee of a company, for example, the copyright and the work that you create is automatically owned by the company. That's kind of part of the deal. You're getting paid, and as an employee, the IP flows through directly to the company. So an artist who's working for a games company, for example, the, the game company owns the rights. However, the individual does retain some rights to use the graphics for their own purposes. So in that circumstance, it's like, yes, the company owns it, but the artist might still have a website that promotes what it is that they've been working on, and that's okay. So that's a kind of a fair use exception, if you like. And similarly, you know, if somebody did an article about you wanting to use some of your work, they don't have to go and ask the company in relation to that. It's kind of a pragmatic uh, rule, really. You know, the company owns it, and they can commercialize it and exploit it. But if there was some sort of uh, exhibition based on your work, you'd be free to kind of demonstrate it and parade it around and all that sort of thing. Okay, so if you own the copyright, what does that actually mean that you can do? So copyright owners can assign or sell or license, which means permit others to use their rights with or without limitations, so such as the type of use, period of time, and with or without conditions. So that's a very big block of things. It basically gives you complete freedom with respect to the underlying idea. So say you've been working on a game and you own the copyright in the game. That also, that means that you can, for example, work with the publisher, so that the publisher can release the game in certain territories. And you might say to that publisher, you've got China, but we're reserving USA and rest of world. And then you can work with another publisher to say, you've got this. It can be carved up in a number of ways. You know, a, a TV company comes along and says, we want to make the animated series based on your game. Well, those rights are yours. You can then pass them on. Somebody says, we want to make merchandise. Those rights are yours. You can pass them on. So when you are dealing with copyright in that sense and you are entering into third-party agreements, you need to be really careful about what it is that you're actually licensing. So what you sometimes see with pretty unscrupulous publishers, for example, is they'll go for a full 360 and they'll just say, we need all rights. And you'll say to yourself, well, hang on a second, I'm only working with you because you've got runs on the board in China. Really, the reason we're working with you is because you can get the game released in China. Why do you need worldwide merchandising rights, for example? So when you look at a publishing agreement, make sure you look at the rights that you're actually granting them because sometimes you can inadvertently let the baby out with the bathwater and sort of provide them with a lot more value than they really had purchased. And you see this a lot, uh, particularly in kind of mini publishers that might have an in with Valve or something like that. And they basically ask for all rights. And they don't really provide any money up front, but they know people in Valve so they can get things happening for you. You can potentially get on the front page. But really, all it is that they've done is relied on one relationship. <clears throat> so you just need to kind of think it through, look at what they've done, and make sure you're only providing them with the rights that they really need. The other thing to remember about copyright, and this is going back to a previous point as well, is that all agreements and transactions relating to copyright have to be in writing, and they have to be signed on behalf of the copyright owner to be effective. So what that means is, in the game jam example I was talking about before, it's no good for everybody to kind of high five and say, yep, cool, we all own 25% of this, that's done, move on. That needs to actually be written down. And in the absence of a written agreement, it's assumed that nothing exists. Now, that doesn't have to be a super complicated document. That just can be a document that you guys literally work on together. And as long as it's kind of quite clear who owns the copyright and it's signed off by each of you, then that will be enough. And it's a, even at the very least, that will be a place to start in the future in the event that there is some sort of dispute and it will give everybody a, a position to work from. <coughs> so yeah, before you get started, make sure everybody's expectations are the same. Make sure the rights are controlled by the same entity and put it in writing. And again, why is this important for the publisher's agreement so, uh, uh, scenario I just gave before? They're literally going to um, ask you as the, as the company to make warranties saying, we warrant that we own the copyright in the game. And if you don't, then everything that they provide to you, they'll come back at you, uh, come back at you for. And not only that, I mean, if you are working potentially with uh, funding bodies and things like that, not that they necessarily exist in South Australia, hint, hint, but in places like Victoria and Queen Queensland, one of the main things that they're going to ask for is that you've got all that stuff in place. So it's an issue that's going to come up again and again. Does anybody have any questions about copyright before I kind of get into... Yes. Yes. 
Yep. No. So that's a that's a common thing because as a director of the company that means you don't necessarily have to kind of pay yourself and there's a bit of flexibility there under fair work but the directors also need to have a relationship with the company as well because remember what I was saying about a company it's a legal entity in its own right so it can it's basically got all the the rights that a human does it can enter into contracts it can do stuff on its own it can sue it can be sued and in the absence of a written agreement as between the director and the company then it's assumed that the director owns it now, it's kind of a limited problem because as a director of the company, it's probably pretty easy to sort of resolve. And the way I get around that is normally just a kind of a one-page letter that just makes sure that the copyright flows through, but it does need to happen. And in the event, for example, that you were to sell your company at some point, that's the type of thing that's going to drive down price. You know, if the copyright's not there, all right, well, that's, a, that's risk, therefore the company's not worth as much money, all that type of stuff. So it's a, a housekeeping issue as much as anything else. Cool. All right, so at this point, you've sort of worked out which entity you're going into business with. You've got all the copyrights sorted out. You know what it is that you're doing. You're thinking, now I need to engage some third parties. So which is the best model that actually suits you? Um, you've got two real options employees versus independent contractors so employees is the one that most of you would be familiar with Shannon would be having worked at Coles <laughs> but um, they're people that are generally paid for the amount of time worked and as I was saying before copyright is owned by the company automatically and that's because of the actual Copyright Act in Australia it actually specifically says that so there's no ambiguity whatsoever the best thing about having an employee is because you're paying them for time, you've got maximum flexibility and control over what it is that they do. But the downside, I suppose, is that you've got obligations to them with their entitlements, particularly in relation to superannuation. So maximum flexibility, but more kind of responsibility in that sense. Whereas independent contractors, on the other hand, it's a bit more footloose and fancy free. So these are generally people that are paid for a result of some kind. And that's the best way to sort of think about contractors. So it's a, a delivery based thing. I'll pay you a thousand bucks. You provide me with the following 15 assets by this date. You pay the money and the job's done. It's a pretty simple way of getting things done. The biggest issue there, of course, is that copyright needs to be dealt with in the terms of that agreement. So it's no good just saying, hey, you're going to perform this work to me. You need to say, and the rights and the work that you've created are assigned to me at the same time in return for the fee. So it's not just about the work, it's about the rights. And that's the two kind of um, biggest issues there. Ultimately, of course, with an independent contract, you've got less control over what it is that they're doing. So, you know, you think of somebody like a plumber. It's like, yeah, you're coming around to my place to fix it. You can't really force them to fix it when it actually needs to be fixed. And it's kind of the same with all independent contractors. They sort of fit it in, in and around their schedule. You've got a deadline, they just deliver it. You don't get to f make them hurry up. I mean, there are certain kind of caveats to that. You can have time-based um, con independent contractor agreements. But the big risk there is that it starts to look like an employee agreement for the from the perspective of fair work. And so the more that something looks like an employee agreement, means the more that you have to treat them like an employee, which means that taking out of their tax and superannuation is probably the big one. There's a lot of misconception out there uh, from a lot of my clients about when superannuation is actually payable. Uh, one of the issues that we've got is under superannuation legislation, the definition of what constitutes an employee is actually a lower threshold than it is under the Fair Work Act. So what I mean by that is somebody can be an independent contractor but nevertheless be owed super. So you've got to be careful. And the reason for that is because otherwise unscrupulous employers that own factories and whatnot would lay everybody off, bring everybody back on as an independent contractor and save themselves 9.5% super. So that's the reason behind it. But just, you've just got to be careful with that and make sure that um, everybody's clear about who is paying for what. Um, yeah, just sort of... I've, already gone over a lot of this and particularly that issue about whether a con there's confusion over if a person is an employee or a contractor so in that sense you should probably always seek professional advice before you do engage a third party just to make sure that you get a lot of this stuff nailed down and yeah if it's a independent contractor then make sure you include a copyright clause <laughs> 
Anyone got any questions about dealing with third parties in that sense? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I'm ca I can't remember what the percentage is. I think it's slightly lower than that. It might be seven. It might be seventy percent. So what that basically means is, if you're an independent contractor and you're deriving sort of seventy percent or more of your income from one source, then that means that automatically that that company should be paying you superannuation. And for the same reasons that I mentioned before, it's really to get around that whole issue of, you know, trying to dodge your responsibilities and 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 kind of get out cheaply. Yeah. It's one of those one-size-fits-all systems that kind of uh, impacts all of us. So basic tax law, I'm just going to be really quick on a lot of this because I'm by no means an accountant, but it's, it's um, worth mentioning. So an ABN and a tax file number, most people have got a tax file number, but an ABN is really easy to get and it's kind of just allows you to become a sole trader automatically and most people should go, probably go through that process at some stage in their life, I think. Um, GST. So you need to, yes? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't lock you down to any kind of course of action. It's just, uh, it's like getting your car registered. It just means that you can be out there on the road doing things. Um, to that end, you know, I would also recommend that if you're going to go to the trouble of getting yourself an ABN, you should probably look at getting public liability insurance, which is pretty cheap, but it just means that dealing with third parties suddenly becomes a lot, a lot uh, more straightforward in the sense that if something goes wrong, somebody falls down the stairs while they come over to your house to talk about work, then you're kind of protected. It, that really is like the registering your car scenario. It's, a, it's an expense up front that protects you and is just a sort of a cost of doing business and it's reasonably easy to get. So GST, so if you have got income that is exceeding 75,000 as an individual in the course of a year, then it's, you have to, have to register for GST and you can recover GST on purchases. So that just means that up until the time that you are registered for GST, you're essentially taking a 10% bullet on everything that, you, that you're purchasing. So in that sense, sometimes it's an idea to get registered a bit earlier. There is an administrative burden there, but it does mean that certain expenses, anything to do with the business, you'll be able to recover the GST automatically. Uh, it can be done at the same time that you get an ABN registered or at a later date. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, PAYG, so if you've got any employees earning over the minimum threshold, which I believe is 18 grand, um, you need to uh, start taking their PAYG and paying that into the, ta the, f the tax account for them on their behalf, which as I was saying before is a bit of an administrative burden, but it's a requirement by law. Um, in terms of other things, uh, you've got insurance, so work cover, and that sort of kicks in once you've got more than one, em one employee, and that's a, a state-based thing, pretty easy to get. And public liability insurance, which I kind of covered before, it's kind of a cost of doing business. So does anybody have any queries about any of that stuff? It's pretty kind of, um, we've hit the very dry, boring part of my, my talk. <coughs> that's for sure. That's, the, that's definitely the domain of the accountants. So this is just some of the stuff you've got to do with respect to GST reporting requirements. And I'll make these slides available so I don't necessarily have to go over this stuff um, with you now. Um, you can grab it then. But yeah, you should probably speak to an accountant about some of these issues. Um, great. Well, that's sort of the scope of what I had planned to talk about today. Does anyone have any questions about any of that or anything else to do with game dev? I've kind of stuck pretty much to dry black letter law today, but I'm happy to talk about anything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, look, I think one of the main things and what Shannon kind of touched on as well is like, make sure you're looking at the actual track record of what these publishers have done. So if what the scope of what it is that they can do is set up a Twitter account or a Facebook page and they're asking for 50% of your revenue based on doing that, I mean, you could do that yourself. What you really need to be looking for is like what these people can actually do, who they're, who, what relationships do they own, 
Do they know somebody at Nintendo? Can they make stuff happen on Switch really easily? You know, that, that type of stuff. And then when you get to the bigger ones, it's like, okay, this is a party game. Do these guys release party games? Is this their thing? You know, look at what it is they're doing. Like, actually do some research about what it is. And in terms of pitching to the publishers, I think you've also got to make it really easy for these people. Make sure that your deck is super tight. Make sure that your pitch is tight. When you send them an email, make sure you've got a link to your press kit. Make sure you've got a really tight pitch that's just right there. Really easy to get in contact. Be responsive in the event that they do. Make it sort of jump out off the email a little bit more. But, you know, that type of stuff, I've spoken to several publishers and they say people send them these ideas that are across a group of emails and it makes them really have to look for it and work for it. It's like they don't want to go through that stuff. They just want to see really clearly what it is and go, cool, that's the mechanic, I get that. That's the, that's the kind of meta game, I get that. That's the art style, I get that. Let's talk and then you can progress on. So just make it enough, enough kind of of the core information in that first um, pitch, you know, particularly if it's an email approach to make it really jump off the page and just make it look super slick and professional and, yeah, hopefully you're in with a shot. I mean, that would be my general kind of observation, which is kind of consistent with what Shannon was saying too, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And it looks a lot of the time, you know, the app store will often say, or c certain app stores say that you must be a company. Like, the, I'm pretty sure that's what Valve kind of says. Um, apps, Apple App Store is a bit more kind of flexible. They just want you to make sure that you warrant that you've got the rights. But yeah, I mean, they are sort of looking for a level of sophistication as to what it is that you're doing. So the more professional that you can kind of appear then you know, the better off that you are. I would say as well that publishers, particularly at the moment, seem to be in the mood for backing teams. You know, the, 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 you know, the people that are behind the idea rather than the, the idea themselves. So it's about looking for people that are looking for uh, long-term relationships. And you see that with um, you know, uh, certain publishers, like whoever published uh, Ken's game, uh, the Mountains game that just came out, they've only, like, they've only published three games this year. And it's the, they're in particular are looking for teams and small teams, you know. So as long as you can kind of pitch to them succinctly your idea, your and demonstrate to them your worth, like you're in with a shot. It's sort of, it's not like a you have to have 70 people working for you in order to be taken seriously. You just need to be able to speak clearly about what it is that you're trying to achieve, and you're in with a shot. I think. No, well, you'd, you'd own the, the, the portion that you created. So in that circumstance, you know, the way out of that might be that everybody, you, the rest of the team have to carve out the artwork and make sure there's no trace of that in order to progress it further. But obviously, the further you get along, the harder that is. And you could, yeah, yeah. No worries. Well, I mean... I gave you my details at the start of the talk. Feel free to get in touch. Probably, as I say, Twitter, Cam Rogers Legal is the best bet. But, yeah, always happy to chat things through with people. So, yep, stay in touch. Cheers. <laughs>